Hey everyone, welcome back. So we're filming this around the holidays. So I got my holiday pajamas on so we can be festive. And the uh, topic of this video is going to be called accept, reject sampling. And sometimes people just call this rejection sampling. So the last video we made on sampling from a distribution was a little while ago. I'll post that video in the description and it was called inverse transform sampling. So that was a method to sample from some distribution. It's a cool method, but the biggest issue with it by far is that we explicitly need the cumulative distribution function, the CDF, in order to do this method. And for a lot of real world distributions, either those that you're using in your research or your job or ones you're forming yourself, you're simply just not going to have access to the CDF. And even if you do, another step in inverse transform sampling is to invert the CDF. We need to take the inverse and that might be difficult even if you have it. So this method, accept reject sampling, is solving a lot of those issues, at least starting to. It's a method which you don't need the CDF for. In fact, you don't even need the full form of the PDF, which is the probability density function. So let's go on. We're going to be working with a real world kind of example here. Let's say that you are the counselor for some department at a university. And the students in this department normally take about four years to complete their studies. And let's say that the way your department works, halfway into their studies, so two years in, they take an assessment which tells us how well or how badly they're doing in their studies. Let's say this assessment can take any score S, where this S is the score they get on the assessment between negative infinity, so more negative means they're not doing well, and to positive infinity. Higher values mean they are doing well. And now let's say that the PDF, the probability density function of the scores that students get on these exams, is given by P of S. So again, to be clear, P of S is a probability density function for S, the score of the student that gets on the exam. Now, we don't know P of S, and that's where this method starts to get interesting. We do know, however, the numerator of P of S. So P of S is equal to some numerator, F of S. So F of S is the function which is the numerator of P of S, divided by NC. NC stands for normalizing constant. And now this is actually a very common thing that we see in probability and statistics, especially as we get into research and work in these fields, where we get this case where we often know the numerator of some probability density function, but we don't know the denominator. And why is that the case? Well, if we think about this NC, how would we compute it? NC would simply just be the integral of the numerator between negative infinity and infinity. That's how we define these normalizing constants. And so that form is given down here. But if you think about taking the integral of this function, which we haven't talked about yet, but it already looks pretty disgusting. If you think about taking the integral of this thing between negative infinity, infinity, it doesn't look like a fun time. Oftentimes it's not even possible. Oftentimes it's just really difficult. So we often get the situation where we can easily get the numerator of the probability density function, but we don't know the explicit form for the normalizing constant. And that's the case we're going to be assuming in this video here. So speaking of that numerator, this is the form of the numerator. We won't need to worry too much about it for this video. We're just going to be talking about it in general. But to talk about it a little bit, we see that it's a piecewise function. So if the student's score is positive, it's given by this sum of exponential functions. If the student's score is negative, it's given by this slightly different sum of exponential functions. And the graph is loosely shown here. So it looks almost symmetric but it's not because there's two different functions going on. It looks almost normal, but it's not again because it doesn't follow the exact form of a normal distribution. So while it looks similar to a normal distribution, kind of, it's not the same, and so we can't as easily sample from it. Which does beg the question now, if we have this probability density function P of S, but we don't explicitly know it, we only know its numerator, what hope do we even have of sampling from this distribution? It seems like it's pretty hard slash impossible. Well, let's move on here. So how do we sample from P of S? The next thing I'm gonna do, so I went through several iterations of this whiteboard trying to figure out the best way to convey this message. And I think what I'll do first is show you the method. So for the next minute or so, just I'm gonna show you the method, but I promise to come back and explain it intuitively and show you why it works. But first let's see how the method of accept reject sampling works. The first thing we do is we sample from some other distribution G of S which is in some sense close to P of S. So the shape is similar to P of S, similar as we can make it. And also we want this to be easy to sample from. So to be more clear here, G of S only needs to satisfy two properties. The first is that we can easily sample from it. And the second is that it needs to span the same domain as our target distribution. So our target distribution goes from minus to positive infinity. And therefore the only two conditions we absolutely need for this different distribution G of S 
is that it is easy to sample from and it also goes from negative to positive infinity. This idea of being close to P of S, so the shape being similar to P of S, is a big added bonus that's going to make our whole process more efficient, as we'll see at the end of this video, but it's not a requirement. But since we were talking about how this is almost symmetric and almost normal, I think the natural thing to use here is g of s being the normal distribution. So that's what we'll use here. And so if we plot f, which is again this black curve here, that's the same curve we saw on this side of the board a moment ago, and we plot this green curve g, which is the normal distribution, then this is what they look like. Now the next step we need to do is ensure that the green line is always above the black line. So we want to scale g up, we want to multiply g by some large enough number such that it is always going to be above f, which is that black curve. So we're going to pick some number m such that for any value of s I choose, so any value of s along this line, if I multiply m and g together, it's always going to be above f. And now that we have all of this set up, this is how accept reject sampling actually works. So step one is to get a sample from g of s again. We said that that is possible because g of s is easy to sample from. So we're going to boop, get a sample from g of s. That could be anywhere, it could be here, it could be here. It's going to be more likely in places where g of s has a higher density and less likely in places where g of s has a lower density, naturally. So that's step number one. And step number two is we're either going to accept this sample or reject this sample. We accept this sample s with some probability given by this formula, which is f of s s being the thing we just sampled from g, divided by m times g of s. And now just a quick note, how do we know that this thing can be interpreted as a probability? How do we know it's bounded between 0 and 1? Well, that comes back to why we did this transformation of multiplying g by some big enough constant m, because we know that this form m times g of s, which is exactly what we see in the denominator here, is always going to be above f of s, which is the numerator here. So this is safely assumed to be interpreted as a probability. It's bounded between 0 and 1, okay? So no issues there. So again, the process is pretty simple. Once you have this set up, you simply just keep getting samples from g of s. And for each sample, you compute this acceptance probability. And then you simply just choose to accept or reject that sample you just got with that probability. And so as you go through this method, you'll have a bunch of samples going to the accept pile, which is this green bar I visualized up here. And other samples will go into the reject pile if they don't meet that probability, which is that reject pile over here. And then after some stopping condition, however many samples you want to get, you're going to stop. And the samples that are in the accept pile, so all of the samples that you've accepted through this process, are very mysteriously right now actually going to be as if you sampled from P of S itself. Now I want to pause here and say that when I first learned this, when I first learned the method, it seemed like magic. It didn't seem like it should work. It doesn't seem like there's anything in it that inherently really has to do with P of S. So how can we say that all these things that we've accepted are actually a draw from P of S? And so how I'll do it, First, I'll prove it to you mathematically, but that's usually not enough for me to really understand it from first principles. So after we prove it mathematically, I'm going to go back and talk about more intuitively why this works. What we want to prove mathematically is if we look at all of the samples that we have accepted in this process, so if we look at all the samples that are in this green accept bar up here, then we want to show that the density of those samples is actually P of S. If we can show that, that proves that all the samples in there are samples from P of S. So we'll start by asking, what is the density? So this capital D is just kind of a stand-in for a density. If you want, you can think of it as a probability symbol. I want it to be a little bit clear here and where densities are not exactly probabilities, but if it mentally helps you, just replace all these capital Ds by probability symbols. You'll get the same intuition. So the density of a sample, given that we have accepted it, okay, that's exactly what we're after right now, we're going to use a little bit of Bayes' theorem here. So whenever we have a conditional, we can write it as the combination of the following terms. The first one being the probability of accepting a sample given the value of the sample is little s times the unconditional density of that sample little s, all divided by the probability that we accept a sample, again, unconditional. So getting from here to here is just using Bayes' theorem. So now we can actually get some good forms for all of these components. So first of all, what's the probability of accepting a sample given that its value is little s? Well, we literally know that's equal to this formula. That's how we constructed the process. So we're going to put in f of s divided by mg of s for that term. Now, what is the unconditional density of getting the sample little s in the first place? Well, that's just the probability, or more specifically, the probability density that our different distribution g would give us that sample back. And so that would just be g of s. And that's all divided by the probability 
that we accept a sample unconditionally. So the only difficult thing to compute now is what's the probability that we accept a sample unconditionally. And we're going to work that out here. It's not too tricky. So we're asking about what's the probability that we accept a sample unconditionally. So it turns out this can be written as an integral because notice there's no conditional on here. So we need to go over all the different possible samples from negative infinity to infinity and ask about what's the probability that we would get this and accept this. And the first part that I just said, the probability that we would get this sample, that it would emerge, is exactly the probability that G would suggest this sample, which is G of S. So that is the probability that we would get proposed this sample. And given that we're proposed that sample, what's the probability that we accept it? That is again the same form here. F of S divided by MG of S, or the acceptance probability. Now we get this nice cancellation of g of s and g of s. So this integral simplifies to 1 over cap m, integral of f of s ds from negative infinity to infinity. Seems a little bit tricky, but where have we seen that form before? Well, that is exactly the formula for the normalizing constant. So it turns out, interestingly enough, that the probability of accepting a sample using this method is given by normalizing constant, whatever that is, divided by big M. Big M again being the thing that we multiply G by to make it always above F. And now completing this formula, so let's bring this down here. We see that density of S given except is equal to what? So this G and this G will actually cancel. So the numerator is just F of S divided by M, F of S divided by M. And the denominator is the probability of accepting, which we just said is normalizing constant divided by M. Normalizing constant divided by M. These m's also cancel out, and mysteriously, magically enough, we get back that the density of getting a sample, given that we accepted it, is equal to f of s divided by normalizing constant, which is exactly p of s, which is exactly p of s. We have just proved mathematically, using the still mysterious method where we use this different distribution g to get candidates and accept them with this probability here. If we do that, we are exactly going to be sampling from P of S. So this works. This mathematically is sound, it works, but if you're anything like me, you're not satisfied at this point because we don't really understand why it works, what's the intuition behind it, and so let's talk about that next. So I think the key in intuitively understanding this method is hidden in this board. And let me highlight the place that I think is the most important. So this ratio here, F of S divided by G of S, let's ignore the M for a second, we'll bring that back in. What does that ratio F of S divided by G of S inherently mean? Well, let's think about if that ratio was very high. If that ratio that I just circled was very high, that means the numerator was very high and the denominator was low. If the numerator is high, that means that the sample we are talking about is very likely in the distribution P because P and F are proportional to each other. So if there's a value of S such that F is very high, that means that value of S is actually very high in P of S as well. So if the numerator is high, it means that it is a sample that is very, very likely. If the denominator is low, that means that it's a sample that is very rare in G of S. It has a very low density. So what would you say if I told you that here's a sample that is very likely in your target distribution, but is very unlikely in your proposal distribution or your candidate distribution G? Well, my first instinct would be accept it, accept it. We might not see it again because we only see samples if they are proposed by G. And if this G is very low for that sample, we might not see the sample again for a really long time. So let's jump on it and accept that sample now. We need it. And that's where the intuition comes in. Because high values for this ratio imply that this is a very important sample, important because it's rare to get proposed, and also because it's very high probability in our target distribution, that leads to very high probabilities of accept, which is why this is exactly the form of our ratio. And this big M is just there so that this F over G can get interpreted as a probability because F over G can be higher than one arbitrarily, higher, lower than one. So M is just there to scale everything down, make sure that we can interpret this as a probability. But the main point I wanna get across is that the thing I've circled, F divided by G, is exactly the quantity that is driving this whole process. If F divided by G is high, these are samples that are very rare to get proposed, but if they get proposed, they're extremely common in our target distribution, so we should accept them. If F divided by G is low, that means these are samples that are very commonly proposed, G is high, and F is low, which means that they don't actually occur too much in our target distribution, so we don't care too much about accepting them.
So once I saw that link, I think the process made a little bit more sense to me, where some different distribution G is throwing samples at us, and we are accepting them based on this ratio here, M just being a normalizer. And so that's accept or reject sampling. And the last thing I'll talk about is just an issue that people commonly face in accept or reject sampling, and that is the choice of G of S. As we said here, we used a normal distribution because it was sort of similar to this, and it was an easy distribution to sample from. But even though I frame this as kind of a real world problem, real world distributions are usually even more complex than something that is kind of nice looking as this. For example, if this black line, this crazy squiggly black line was your F, then we need to go through the same steps. If we want to use the normal distribution again, we need to multiply the normal distribution by some big enough constant M, so it's always going to be above this. And that wouldn't really be a problem, except for this terrible spike that happens in F, which means that we need to scale the normal distribution up so much that it's going to be above this spike. What that means is that M is going to be huge because we need to multiply the normal distribution by a very large number to always be above F. And what does it mean if M is huge? Well, look at this probability of accept. That was normalizing constant divided by M. If M is massive, then this quantity becomes very small so the probability of accepting a sample goes towards zero. What that means for our process is that G is going to keep proposing us samples. Hey, do you want to accept this? Do you want to accept this? But because our M was so large, our probability of accepting any of those samples is extremely low, very close to zero. So this process is going to take a very, very, very long time in order for us to get however many samples we need to get. So although this algorithm, this method that I've proposed seems pretty similar, it's just a two-step process, the real heavy lifting and the real creative work, if you choose to use this process, comes before that. And choosing a G that is similar sort of to your target distribution, which isn't a problem if your target distribution looks nice, but is potentially a problem if your target distribution looks kind of disgusting like this. So this choosing your G is a big art, and if you do it wrong, you're going to lead to very inefficient process here. Okay, so that was accept reject sampling, or sometimes it's called just rejection sampling. Hopefully, um, I've showed you a couple things. I've showed you why we need it instead of inverse transform sampling many times in the real world. I've showed you how it works. I've showed you mathematically that it works. But most importantly, hopefully you understand now intuitively why it works. And it all comes down to this F over G ratio. Okay, so if you learned something, please like and subscribe. Any comments are always welcome below, and I'll see you next time.